The predicted August thunderstorm seemed only minutes away as the 35 cars in the starting field rolled through the pace lap. Based on a complicated scoring system which awards points for finishing first through sixth, Mustang leads in the standings. In fact, a victory locks up the championship for fourth. To keep its hopes alive, the Javelin team must outpoint Mustang here, the most important race to date in the series. Arnelli Jones stands on it right from the start, sprinting away from the field with Mark Donahue directly behind him. Arnelli usually turns his fastest laps during the early going, spurred on by an empty track in front of him and Mark Donahue in his mirror. Swede Savage in the number 42 Barracuda slips by Vic Elford's Camaro and takes over third position. Elford's lack of experience in Trans Am competition could be the reason. Or perhaps his Camaro just isn't running the way Jim Hall expects. With the first lap complete, it's Mustang, Javelin, Barracuda, and Camaro in the first four positions. The leaders stretch it out, putting more and more daylight between themselves and the rest of the pack. And Jones and Donahue go at it like every lap is the last one of the race. Parnelli attacks the course ferociously, turning a lap in one minute, 14.65 seconds, averaging almost 111 miles per hour. But Donahue stubbornly hangs on. The factory entries quickly catch the tail end of the field. With the track ahead of him looking like a parking lot, Parnelli doesn't even think about shutting down. It's in this heavy traffic that PJ's years of experience and uncanny driving skills pay off. A few seconds behind the leaders, Elford's Camaro is passed again. This time by Peter Repson's number nine Javelin, now running fourth. The Camaros, plagued with bad luck throughout the series, seem to be in deep trouble again. Elford's teammate, Ed Leslie, limps around the course with a blown tire, all but eliminating himself from contention. Martelli's tires, damaged by one of his off-course shortcuts, begin smoking badly, but he's past the pit entrance and must go around again. Several of the slower cars unlap themselves by passing the crippled Mustang. A gentle drizzle begins to fall, just enough to bring the oil out of the track. Parnelli gets out of shape on the fast bend and falls even farther behind Donahue, who is already in the pits. Donahue's javelin is already refueled and taking on rain tires when Parnelli nurses his car into the pits. The Mustang crew works feverishly. But Donahue beats Jones out of the pits with room to spare. The other factory entries make their stops. While the scramble into the pits continues, Parnelli loses even more time by spinning on the rain-slicked pit straight. Mark Donahue now leads, followed by George Fulmer, who has come all the way from seventh position. With the first of two mandatory pit stops behind them, the cars plow around the slippery track toward their second stop a factor which could decide the outcome of the race. The Watkins Glen Trans Am continues as Donahue builds his lead second by second through the rain, driving carefully and consistently. But the real action is happening behind him. Peter Repson's number nine javelin whips by George Homer. The javelins are now running one, two. Coupled with their customary edge in the pits, that makes the prospects of the American Motors team very rosy indeed. Sweet Savage's Barracuda and Vic Elford's Camaro are running fourth and fifth. The rain slackens and Elford chooses this moment to turn it on. He slips by Savage to take fourth place. 
The Camaro appears to be running smoothly now, its earlier difficulties behind it. And Elford seems to be finally accustomed to the pace and the style of the race. He pours it on, passing Fulmer to take third position. Then Elford breaks up the one-two javelin combination by passing Revson to move into second. Elford's charge is a classic. He picks up four positions in as many laps. Not an easy accomplishment on a soggy track. Behind Elford, Savage and Fulmer are running fourth and fifth. Under the watchful eye of Roger Penske, Donahue has built what appears to be a comfortable 29-second lead. Swede Savage knocks himself out of contention when he pits for repairs. George Fulmer stages a comeback of sorts, passing Revson to take third position. Donahue comes into the pits on his second and last stop to shed his rain tires and take on fuel. The normally lightning-quick Penske Javelin crew appears confused and disorganized. The course is only one important left-hand turn, so dropping just the outside rain tires would save time in the pit and not affect the handling of the car. But the Javelin's rain tires are bigger than its dry tires, so all four must be changed to run on a dry track. In the frantic scramble to change the tires, the seconds and Donahue's lead slip away. Vic Elford's Camaro takes the lead with Donahue still in the pits. To the agonized Javelin crew, the stop seems to drag on endlessly. Donahue finally gets out and almost tangles with Parnelli Jones, now running a distant sixth, a full lap behind the leader. Even that far back, Parnelli won't accept being passed if he can avoid it. The number one Camaro stays on the track while the other factory entries come into the pits. Elford is trying to build his 30-second lead as much as he can before pitting. Penske is greatly concerned. Homer holds second position with Donahue right behind him. If the race ends this way, Javelin is eliminated from this year's championship. Elford hangs on to his lead as Hall plans strategy for his last pit stop. The Camaro's rain tires are exactly the same size as its dry tires. The crew ignores the inside tires and changes only the rubber on the outside. Elford is going to try to win running half wet and half dry. The stop is a quick one. Elford gets out with a lead of 15 seconds over second place Fulmer. Bud Moore, boss of the Mustang team, is worried. Fulmer and Donahue roar down the pit straight, almost even. Elford in first continues to run smoothly and seems ready to lap fifth place Peter Redson. Then it happens. Donahue passes Fulmer to take second. And is almost immediately repassed. Less than a car length separates the Mustang and the Javelin as they charge around the track, grinding away at Elford's lead. But there isn't enough time left to catch Elford. Barring a mechanical failure, or a spin, or an accident, or a blowout, or any one of a dozen things that have already happened to the Camaros in the current series of races, Elford should come home a winner. It's Homer and Donahue following, still running as close together as two cars can run. For Ford, the Trans Am Championship rides on every turn of the track. It's the last chance for Javelin. And Donahue makes good. On the last lap of the race, he passes the faltering Fulmer to take second. Elford has it won and takes the checker. Ten seconds back, Donahue hangs on as Mustang and Javelin go into the last turn together. It's Donahue's Javelin by one car length in second. Homer is third. 
No one will be second-guessing Jim Hall this time. His Camaro, except for some early trouble, ran flawlessly, just the way he planned. And his choice as driver, Vic Elford, wins his first Trans Am race on only his second try at it. Hall's crew came through when it counted, changing only the outside rain tires in less than 15 seconds to preserve Elford's lead. In this race, Jim Hall's Camaro team put it all together. The ultimate combination of driver, car, and crew needed to win in trans-American competition. Chris Economaki is in victory lane with Parnelli Jones and Vic Elford. And here's Parnelli Jones, the early leader, and the man who set the fastest lap and picked up the Ballantyne $1,000 award. Congratulations, Parnelli, but you did have a tough day, didn't you? Yeah, I really did. I, uh, uh, Leslie lost a tire or something, and he slowed down. I went around the outside of him, and uh, um, I guess my tire was pretty thin at that point. When I did, I blew it out. And uh, uh, I really didn't, uh, I couldn't just, it was, I just didn't have enough time to get in the pits there, and I had to run another lap on it, and of course it come apart, and, and, uh, and then I, right after that, I put the rain tires on, and I spun a couple of times, so uh, uh, I just... One of those days, to, huh? Yeah, right. Nothing like a cold beer after a victory, eh, Vic? So beautiful. Was it a difficult race for you? Uh, not really, no. It wasn't much of a race, actually, for me, because I got uh, left behind a bit at the start, and then suddenly after the shower, I found myself in front, and, uh, you know, it wasn't too bad from there on. It was a bit slippery, but there was nobody ever at any time really sort of running with me. Either I was behind them or they were behind me. Were you called into the pits for the tire change or did you come in voluntarily? Uh, I was called in. We, um, you know, one more lap and I'd have come in if they didn't tell me, but in fact we were called in. What was it like when it was raining on the dry tires? Uh, a bit slippery. Just a bit slippery. We saw a lot of cars doing dipsies and didos. Did you have any trouble? Uh, no, I didn't have any trouble at all on the dry tires. In fact, when they put the wet tires on, they were new and I went off the road twice on the first two laps with those but uh, with the dries, not at all. Well, it ended well for you, and congratulations, Vic Alford. Thanks very much, Chris.